All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Make Anything. I am doing this as a live stream, but uh, really, I'm just kind of trying to do a more of an online lecture type thing. So I'm not going to be interacting with the chat like crazy. Uh, more so, I just wanted to show you guys the full process of me designing a very simple part in Fusion 360. And I figured the easiest way to do that is just to stream it live. So that's what we're doing today. And yeah, this is pretty much an impromptu stream. I was going about my day filming things for another video. And here's my camera rig, just so you guys can get an idea of what I film on. It's a Panasonic GH5, which I've had for maybe about a year, I think less. It's got a Sigma 18 by 35 millimeter lens. It's got this rig with an extra battery, a big old monitor. Uh, I made the classic mistake of a newbie building a camera rig, which was to just make everything big and impressive looking, even though that makes it a lot heavier and sometimes inconvenient. Although I'll say I do like the monitor this size, and I do like the workout I get from having to carry this big thing around. Anyways, I know most of you probably don't have a camera rig like this, but that doesn't mean it won't be a useful stream for you guys today, because this is more just about my process of designing something. So where was I getting with this? Well, yeah, I was filming with my camera rig, as I always do. And uh, for the second time, this part that locks the monitor to my rig here, uh, it's got this big screw that you kind of just tighten awkwardly. And it can get really tight, but it'll also loosen on its own. And that happened. So the entire monitor slipped off and crashed to the ground. It got caught on the cable, and luckily it didn't smashed to bits, but I'm not going to test that for a third time. So I decided I would stop everything today and design a part to lock this into place to make it a lot safer. So let me take off the microphone and kind of make this a little easier for you guys to see. Oh, is there a sound delay as always? Sorry about that, guys, but hopefully uh, it's bearable. Tell me if not, and I'll take the time to fix it. But Anyways, here's the mount. It's got a standard, what's called a cold shoe mount. It's just a something used very commonly in photography. This thing slides on and screws into place. Works for a lot of things, but for a heavy rig like this, apparently it doesn't work that well. <laughs> Anyways, I noticed that on the front of this rig, there's all these holes. There's this huge threaded hole in the middle. I don't have any bolts that size, but then I noticed there's two smaller threaded holes just above that. And I went ahead and rummaged through my pile of screws, and I realized they're M3 size. So I've got two M3 screws here. Let me see if I can get those in there. It's hard to get them threaded, but anyways. There we go. So as you can see, we can screw two M3 screws in there, and that gives us a way to mount something in a very strong way. You know, I don't want to make my entire part 3D printed. Printed threads, well, they work in a lot of cases, but when I'm trying to lock down a $100 piece of equipment or something like that, I'm going to try to play it safe, and I'm going to use metal hardware. But the rest of it, we're going to 3D print. And that's what we're going to do right now. If uh, I think anyone should be able to follow along, whether oh, is there some buzzing? Gosh, I'm sorry, guys. That's what happens when you do a stream impromptu like that. Um, anyways, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into Fusion 360. Uh, the only thing we're going to be doing is measuring parts as we go along. I have my digital caliper. This thing costs about 25 bucks. This specific brand, I can't find it anymore, or at least not this model, but there's plenty of good rated electric calipers on uh, Amazon or wherever you buy things online. It's pretty much the only way to buy things right now. Anyways, this is the handiest tool. Uh, if you're interested in designing 3D printing, I'd say this is probably the first tool you want to get before you even get a 3D printer. I always encourage people to learn design before they actually get a printer, just because you can do so much more when you can design things yourself. That's what we're going to find out 
on today's stream because I'm going to do a very simple design and it's going to be <laughs> helping me protect a very expensive piece of equipment. So that's pretty cool. So really, all we have to do is measure a few things. We want to make a cap, or at least I want to make a cap that matches this profile, but it's just a panel that I'll be able to screw down and it'll go up a little bit higher so that it covers that uh, cold shoe mount so the part can't slide out even if the screw becomes loose. It would require all three screws to come loose and it's very unlikely that that will happen without me noticing. So we're gonna jump into Fusion. Fusion Cam, Whoosh. wow, technology. Almost, almost good technology. There's Okay. Yes, technology. <laughs> All right, so we're in Fusion. Uh, hopefully you can see me good enough here in the corner because I will be measuring things at the same time, but I'll tell you guys my measurements and stuff. Oh, okay. I'll turn down the mic. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Mic volume was way too high. Sorry, guys. All right, mic volume is lower. Um, I don't think there's any quick way for me to fix the delay. So, just, <laughs> unless it's really too bad. Tell me if it's like really bad, but if you can still follow along, I think a little bit of delay is okay. Um, so here we're in Fusion 360. Uh, I have another video showing you how to get it for free. You just need to sign up for an educational license. The process might have changed a little bit, but if you Google how to get a free student license, Fusion 360, I'm sure there's an easy way to do it. So we've got it now, and I'm going to go ahead and start by starting a new sketch, which is almost always how you start, because to create a 3D object, you first must create a two-dimensional profile. So we'll create a sketch, and here we have the three different planes, x, y, and z. Um, Sometimes I'll design things based on how I want to print it on the build plate. Other times I'll design it based on how it would be on the actual part because this part is going to be stuck on like that. But when I print it, it'll be lying down flat. I'm going to go ahead and model it as if it would be printed because I'll just make things a little easier. So I select the top plane. We're looking straight down from the top. And now I'm just going to start measuring the profile of this front part so that I can match it with my 3D printed part. So let me try to get this reel up close. I'm gonna start by measuring the width of this whole thing. We're gonna measure the height of the whole thing. And then I'll try to get in and measure just the little chamfers as well. I can't exactly do that in front of the camera, but let's see. The width is it's showing me 25.75. 25.75. So I'm going to go ahead and create a center rectangle here. Click on the origin. It'll snap there. And then I'll create the rectangle. Now I can hit D to open the dimension tool. Or you can click it right here. I guess I'll not use too many shortcuts today just to make it nice and easy. And here I can click on this line and give it that dimension that we just measured, 25.75. There's one locked in, and you see how those two lines on the sides turn black? That's because they're dimensioned. They're locked into place. The center is locked to the origin, and this width is locked. Therefore, these black lines are fully defined. These blue lines can still move up and down because we haven't told Fusion how tall the part is. So we'll go ahead, stay in the dimension tool. Whoops. With this line selected, we can hit the dimension tool. Then we can click, and now I have to measure the height. So I think it's a square, actually. But maybe not. I hope you guys know how calipers work. Oh, yeah, it looks like it's 25. I'm getting 24.9. This might just be my janky measuring. I'm pretty sure it's 25 by 25, but... Um, well, let me measure it back here. It's a little easier to measure. It's a little easier to measure on the back. It's the same same height and everything, but it's just less in the way. So I'm getting 25. And yeah. Measuring it a little more carefully, I'm seeing it's exactly 25 by 25. 
Usually if your caliper is showing 25.05 or something, it's usually the caliper that's wrong. And usually the part is pretty accurate, especially with a aluminum cast part like a camera rig. Anyways, we've got that. Let me switch back to dev cam real quick so I could show you. For the chamfer, um, this isn't really the most proper way to do it, but if you just kind of try to go from point to point, you can measure the length of that side. And I get 4.75 uh, for more like 4.5. 4.5 is the length of the diagonal. So that's not equal to the length of a chamfer. If I were to use the chamfer tool, it would it would be like, uh, oh, I can't point at the screen. Here, we'll select the line tool. Um, well, anyways, <laughs> I'm going to make the diagonal line here. I'm going to do the chamfer within the sketch. And as you can see, I drew it at about a 45 degree angle, and it already figured out what I was trying to do. It created a perpendicular constraint. So this and this are perpendicular. So that's actually exactly what I wanted. Um, let's go ahead and do it on all the corners. So you can see it kind of snaps into place with that square, showing that it's a right degree, a right angle right there. So boom, boom. We'll do all of these, not worrying about the measurements. Let's just make sure they all snap perpendicular. There we go. Now what I can do is hold Control and click on each of these lines to select them all at once. And then I'll let go of control, right click here, and I'm going to select equal. So now these are all the same size. I'll hit D or click dimension up here. And then I'm going to click this and drag out diagonally. The dimension will actually change what it's measuring depending on where you move the mouse. So we can measure the just the X direction here or just the Y, or we can measure the width of the diagonal, which is what I measured with my calipers. So really, you can use any of those measurements, and it would define this. I'm just doing it based on what was easiest for me to measure. So there we go, 4.5. So that's the profile. That's the outer outline of this thing. Oh, switching cameras. OK, good job. Thanks for the reminder, guys. Let me undo that again. <laughs> it's super easy anyways. So we're going to click the Line tool, click from one edge here to another edge. And we'll just bring it until it snaps into that right angle, as you can see with that square. Boop. And then you can see the perpendicular with that icon right there. That means it's perpendicularly constrained. I'll hit L or click the line tool here and make the others. Sorry, guys. I'm going to hold control now, select each of these lines. One, two, three, four, release control, right click on this line, and then uh, go up here to constrain them to make sure they're all equal to one another. Now I only have to put in the measurement for one of them. So I'll hit dimension, and I'll select this line and drag out diagonally. As I was saying when you couldn't see, you can measure the uh, x dimension, you can measure the y dimension, or you can drag out diagonally and measure that diagonal width, which is what we measured with the calipers, 4.5 millimeters. And since these are all constrained to be equal, they all lock into place when I just adjust this one. And that's why constraints are nice. Constraints are nice. If I did this whole design and then I realized, oh wait, these were actually five, I don't have to go back and change everything. I just have to change this one value to five and they'll all adjust to make it 15. But we want it to be 4.5. OK. So that's already uh, a good part of it. We could do the entire model within this one sketch, or we could do it in several sketches. Um, it's not too complicated yet. So we'll go ahead and include the holes that the screws are going to go through to mount our little plate onto the front of this camera. So to do that, we have, well, let's switch back to this camera. And I'll make sure to switch back again when we go back into Fusion. But if you look, you can see that hole I'm pointing to and the one on the other side. Those are the two that we actually want to include. Everything else, I'm just going to cover it because I don't need those. 
We just need holes for those two, which are the ones that my M3 screws are going to go through. And it looks like they are symmetric, you know, which is pretty standard. If you drew a line down the middle, the left and the right one would be perfect mirrors of each other. And hence, we're going to use the mirror function. So here, I still have the line tool selected, so I'll drag up and draw a line. By the way, um, when I'm drawing lines, oftentimes I just go here and click the check mark. But another cool little thing I learned is that if you really quick and double click, it'll just automatically commit to your line like that. Oh, I did it again, the camera thing. <laughs> what I was saying is, hey, exit line tool. OK, let me delete it. In the line tool, instead of clicking the check mark to end a line, you can just double click. It's a nice little trick that I'm still learning to use. Anyways, as I was saying, we're going to make this a mirrored function. So I'm going to create this line from the origin. We know the origin is in the center. So if I go from the center, drag straight up. And that triangle means that we're locking to the midpoint of this line. So we know it's just going straight up, vertical line. That's going to be our mirror plane. So if we draw something on one side, we can mirror it directly to the other side. And that's what we're going to do with our two holes. Now, first off, I've got the circle tool here. I'm just going to draw a circle. Make sure it doesn't try to lock to anything. And if you want to make sure that it's not locking to anything and creating constraints that you don't want, you can hold down Control. And now, even if I go right to the midpoint, it won't try to snap to it. As long as I'm holding down Control, it'll not create any constraints, which can be nice. So now we have a circle here. I'm going to use my calipers again. Instead of using this part to measure the outer dimensions of something, I'm going to use these little parts, which allow you to measure the inner dimensions of things. So I'm going to go ahead, stick that little point inside the hole. <laughs> I can't do this in front of the camera. I'm just going to go ahead and use that tool like so. And that lets me measure the inside. Actually, no. Forget that. I don't have to do that, because I have the screws that are going to go into that hole. It's way easier to just measure the screw instead of trying to measure the hole. Ha. Huh. So if I measure the screw, it comes out to just about 3.9. I want to have a little bit of clearance. So I'm going to go ahead and just make that 4.1 millimeters. So we can hit. That dimension tool, select the circle, give it a dimension of 4.1. And as soon as, oh, I freaking forgot to change the camera again. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't do this anymore in the future. We'll see. Or I should just get better. OK, circle tool, create a circle. And while you're creating it, if you hold down Control, it won't snap to anything. That's what I was saying. It won't create a dimension. Darn it, guys. I'm trying here. <laughs> I was like, I'll get this tutorial done in like 30 minutes. Easy. But then I have this whole camera situation. So uh, I selected the dimension tool here. I'll select the circle, click, and enter the dimension, which I said was 4.1 millimeters. It locks that into a 4.1 millimeter diameter. But as you can see, the circle is still blue because we need to position it on here. And this might be the trickiest part. Um, as you can imagine, using calipers, it's not easy to measure from the center of a circle like this. You can't really measure from the center point down to the bottom or something like that. It's, it's hard to get the center. We actually have to measure from the bottom of the circle to the bottom of this part or something like that. So to do that, what I'll do is select the line tool and create a line from the center here and just drag it straight down until it snaps to the bottom. And that'll create a point here that we can reference. So now I can select that bottom of the circle. I can select the bottom of this profile, click, and then I can measure, whoops, I can measure that exact dimension in real life on my part here from the bottom of the circle to the bottom of the part. 
Oop, I'm not going to switch cameras this time. I think you guys get the idea. <laughs> and that dimension turns out to be... Well, it's kind of hard with the monitor in the way. Let me get that out of the way. That dimension turns out to be... I'm getting 8.4. It's probably 8.5, but no, 8.4. Looks like a pretty solid 8.4. So I'm going to change that to 8.4, hit enter, and it adjusts. Yeehaw. Wait a minute. That is so wrong. It's definitely higher than. Oh, I was measuring the wrong. I was measuring the wrong hole. OK. It's 14.25. There we go. Always measure twice, they say. So now we have the height locked in, and now we just need the, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Width locked in. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. Let's zoom in here again, create a line. And this time, I'm going to take the line out to the side. And that way, I have another point here to reference from this side of the circle to this edge of the part. So I'm going to repeat, do that exact measurement that you're seeing there doing it in real life on the part here. And I get 6.3, 6.3 millimeters, 6.3. Enter that. And now it's black. It's locked in. Awesome. What we can do now is select that circle. We can go to Create, Mirror. We've got that object selected. And then the mirror line is going to be this line we created at the start. Flippity flop, there we go. <laughs> that still looks kind of off. I'm going to do a, another measurement just to be sure. So uh, let's see, we can do that again in this direction. We can measure the distance between the insides of the circles. And also just this. see this is splitting the circle up into a bunch of different profiles. That could be annoying, so we can select these lines and hit X to make them construction lines which is exactly what we're using them as. They're just references for making measurements and things like that. So now if I click between these two center points, it's already dimensioned here, but it'll tell me what the math says, that it should be 4.2. If I measure it in real life, I get 5.25. So I did something wrong. Let's see what I did wrong. I'm going to delete this and delete this. I kind of trust this inner measurement more. 5.25. That just looks more right. So I'm wondering, I either got the measurement for the circles wrong, or I got something wrong. So let me measure these circles again. Right, three, they're about three. Oh, because I measured the bolt versus measuring this, the hole. And because the threads, the threads make it look wider. Gosh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure by measuring the distance between the centers, that'll be accurate enough. Right, I gave it a bit of clearance. OK, I see what it is. See, I made these circles larger than the actual holes because I want to give it clearance. But that screws up my measurements. So I have to create the actual measurement, which was 3.85, something like that. Whoops. 3.85. And I'll mirror that as well. And now I can go to the point tool. And I'll add points right there and right there. And I'm going to measure between those lines. That measurement is 5.25. There we go. And those are construction lines, too. So I'll select them and hit X. Gosh, this is a simple part, but it gets kind of complex, huh, when you're running through it all. But actually, that's the part. It's a plate with some holes in front of it. Now we can go to Solid, hit Extrude, click on that profile, and make it as thick as we want. 
and I'm going to go ahead and make it three millimeters thick because that's just a good number. For, it's just a good number. I do want to make sure that the screws can actually tighten that much. I didn't test how far in they can go. Oh yeah, looks like they can go all the way in. So three millimeters will work. The screws will run through that and hold that plate against this thing and cover the cold shoe mount so that my external monitor can't slip out. This is really the whole part. I don't have to do anything else. I'm just gonna add some chamfers which help it print a little more cleanly, make it a little easier to drive the screws through. So I'm gonna select all of these top and bottom edges with the chamfer tool selected. Sorry, I did that really quickly. Or no, I hit the shortcut for chamfer. You go to modify chamfer right here. It's hard to do tutorials when you're at my level and you've created custom shortcuts for a lot of the functions and you forget not to use those. So I'll make that 0.4 millimeters. And as you can see, that kind of gives it a blocky rounded look. That means if the first layer of the print is a little squashed, it won't go over the dimension. Same here, it won't make the hole smaller than it's actually meant to be. That's it, that's the whole part. I told you it was simple, guys. Now all we have to do is go right here on the body. We can right click it, hit save as STL. And all the default settings here are fine. We'll hit OK. I've got my camera file. We'll name it monitor saver. Actually, we'll name it the monitor savior because it's going to give my monitor eternal life. I'll go ahead, eject that file, and my slicer is on my other computer, so I'm not going to show you guys the slicing. I just wanted to show you the Fusion 360 process. Um, I will show you, I, I will go ahead and get the model printing right now so you guys can watch it. As you saw, I accidentally switched to the print cam a few times. Um, but yeah, slicing, I'm not doing anything crazy anyways, there's nothing Special, I'm going to do a 100% infill part because I want this to be strong. It is just PLA, which some people would say, oh, that's kind of sketchy, using PLA to hold in an expensive piece of equipment. But there's really not going to be a ton of stress on this part. Um, I think it would be clear that the part is going to fail before it actually fails. And I'm also using, I'm going to be using uh, Poly Alchemy's Elixir PLA, which is like the really cool shiny silk PLA. Um, it's really fancy looking, but I'm using it because it's a little more flexible than regular PLA. So instead of just snapping, it's more likely to bend. And what do you know? It's an eight minute print. Even printing it solid, it's such a simple part that it'll be done really quickly, which is awesome. All right. I went ahead and sliced it, and uh, I've ejected the flash drive. I'm going to mute my camera a bit because I'm going to stand up and switch to the print cam. Let's plug this thing in and get a print started. All right, I'll turn the mic back on. Might be kind of quiet. Um, I'm not doing anything special. I'm just going to hit select the file and hit print. I've already got the filament that I want loaded here. It's that silk, silky filament I was telling you about. It's not much left, so there's a nice little part to get rid of the last of it. And it's already heating up. For some reason, as soon as I hit print, you can see the, the bar down there. It's 
It's already showing that it's at 4%. You see the little progress bar? There's some green there. Ah, let me use my computer mouse. Yeah, if you look <laughs> right there, you can see it, it went straight to 4%. I don't know if that's just because it's such a quick print that it's like, all right, I'm heating up. I'm already 4% through the file. I guess that's it. Sometimes if, if I eject the file too quickly from my computer and I create a corrupt G-code file, when you hit print, you'll see it start progressing through the print without actually starting. That's a pretty telltale sign that you made a mistake. Hold on now. All right, Mike's back in. Um, yeah, so now that we're waiting for this to print, I actually can hang out and chat with you guys for a bit. Uh, this is the Artillery Genius. It's not the Sidewinder printer that I've reviewed before. This is the Genius, which I will be reviewing very shortly, along with a few other direct drive printers. Uh, if you saw my Sidewinder review, I got pretty excited about direct drive because it's a, it's a cool, cool, cool technique for printing. Technique, strategy, mechanism, I don't know. My first 3D printer was direct drive, and then almost every printer after that was a Bowdoin style printer, just because I uh, tend to review the lower cost printers, and Bowdoin is lower, lower cost for the parts, I believe. All right, let me try to focus this a bit more. There's a little bit of filament dangling off of it. Hopefully that won't be a problem. I'm gonna to try to let it go on its own. Usually when a print starts, I'm standing there with some pliers to pluck away the little bit of excess stringiness that comes out at the start. But I think it's doing all right. This printer is pretty self-reliant. Drone beatboxing. Um, I don't know if you want me to do a tutorial for FreeCAD because I've never used it, so it would be a pretty bad tutorial. <laughs> I mean, look at me today. I know Fusion 360 like the back of my hand, and I still stumbled through this tutorial a bit. More, more so just my production. <laughs> production needs work, but hey. So I'm seeing in the chat, it's very late for a lot of people. I'm in California, it's six o'clock in the evening here, so it's actually a perfect time for me. But I understand the West Coast is usually uh, behind everyone else. The problem is I'm behind even the West Coast. I stay up late, wake up late, so uh, my brain is, an, is in a different time zone <laughs> than my body. All right, it's printing. Look at it go, pretty zippy. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's a super quick eight minute print, not only because it's so small, but also parts with very few flat faces will print quicker. Whenever there's a straight line, the printer can accelerate a little bit while it's traveling that line. And all those little things add up to quicker prints. Um, yeah, I can show you this, like, this is my Astrolabicon I actually haven't shared this version yet. This is the pro retro style. As you can see, it's got those retro lines, but it's also got that swooped shape of my new pro version of the Astrolabicon puzzle. And um, yeah, so this version with all these ridges compared to the exact same model without the ridges, same size and everything, this one takes like twice as long because it's got to do all those little bumps instead of being able to just do quick swoops. So. It's not just size that affects the print speed. Yeah, Colin, way to notice that I am, oh, pointing behind me. I am using the lights that I made using uh, just standard shop lights, mounted them to tripod stands. And now you can see there's a little bit of a diffuser on them, which I recently added. That's actually just the diffusion sheet that's on the inside of LCD TVs. 
I had an old TV that was getting thrown out. I took it apart and I found that sheet inside and it helps diffuse the light a bit. And that's how I get this green screen effect. Joe, will your stock CR10S Pro do flexible filament? Um, I think it'll depend on the filament. It should be able to do like a Shore 90 or sure, yeah, like something in that range. Some of the less flexible, flexible filaments. Um, one of the most flexible filaments is Ninja Flex. That would have a hard time printing on the CR10S Pro. I think you could do it, but you'd have to print super slow compared to a direct drive printer like this thing or the Sidewinder. Direct drive and flexibles, that's kind of like where they shine when they're paired together. What's my favorite thing that I've 3D printed? I think I get asked that question in every stream, which I understand. It would be cool to know like the very coolest thing I've ever made. But that's something that changes all the time. I'm super excited about my Astrolabicon puzzles because not only do I think they look very nice, but they are they play well. They're like an awesome puzzle. And uh, it's pretty exciting. And they always sell out pretty much as quickly as I can make them. So I'm, I'm making more, guys. Francisco, how did I get the commission for the numbers? So... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not like a full-time freelancer. I basically do commissions and freelance work uh, to fill in any extra time I have because being a full-time freelancer is really hard work to get constant jobs. You know, you might be able to get paid more per hour, but there's also a lot of time between jobs where you're just trying to get another lead. That's hard work. So I try to not do that. And that's why I'm trying to keep YouTube going because... That's more my speed. That's more my style. Um, but this job I actually got from my sister. She worked at an interior design firm that needed the numbers. And so she referred them to me. So <laughs> unfortunately, I can't give you that advice doesn't really apply to any other situation. That was kind of just I happen to know the right people. Which actually is quite frankly, kind of how it works in the real world. If you're going to freelance, you kind of just have to make connections. Um, and you have to you have to do a good job. That way you maintain the same clients. You want to be able to have repeat customers because it is hard to get, uh, to get new people. But the numbers, yeah, that was, this is all just knowing the right person or the right person knowing me in that case. Have I ever had a really bad accident with 3D printers? Not in the not in the sense of going to the hospital or anything. I've definitely been too confident and left huge prints to just have a massive pile of spaghetti afterwards. I think everyone who has a 3D printer has been through that. And I've definitely burned my fingers more times than I can count on my burned fingers. <laughs> No, I haven't had any serious accident on a 3D printer to answer that question. Vanessa, where can you donate face shields in LA? I'm not sure about LA. I know Matter Hackers in Lake Forest, they just put out a donation box in front of their office. So now you can actually just go there and drop it off without having to interact with anyone. Um, I'm sure you can mail it to them, but as far as locally in Los Angeles, I'm not sure. Um, it does seem like there's kind of face shield operations popping up in every little, in their own cities, basically, which is kind of how it has to be. And at this point, honestly, a lot of people have gotten to the point where they're injection molding them now. And that is just so much faster than 3D printing that I have a feeling there won't be too much demand for 3D printed face shields in a week or two, but... Um, definitely keep making them if people are I, I've had people coming to me like begging for them so they're definitely in demand I'm not going to try to tell you to stop 3d printing them just yet but uh, keep an eye on that keep an eye on the demand because as soon as companies are able to injection mold them and make 10,000 a day instead of printing like a dozen a day um, yeah it's clearly going to help out in that situation 3d printing 
saved the day because you could start, you could design something and print it the same day, like just like I'm doing right now. And you can't do that with an injection mold. But once the mold is built, you can make way faster parts, which is why the world is not completely dominated by 3D printing just yet. Wow, Michael, printing 3000 for a hospital in Miami. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's really impressive. I know Matter Hackers, uh, I read today that they shipped out 12,000 face shields already. It's super cool how, how big of an impact you can have when everyone comes together. Because it's not like, it's just people here and there with one or two printers printing out 30, maybe 100 face shields if they're really working their butt off. But 120 people do that and you've got 12,000 face shields. It's pretty insane. Hey, our part's done. All right, let me go ahead and grab it. Oh, I need a special. Usually you'd want to wait. You usually want to wait for the plate to cool down a little bit and it would come off easier, but this is such a small part that I can just pop it right off. I almost lost that. <laughs> hey, there it is. It looks a little dirty for some reason. I think that's just the last filament I had. Ooh, it's still nice and warm. All right, there it is. Super simple part. Um, I'm a little bit worried about how it's gonna align because uh, I didn't measure those holes super perfectly, but I have a pretty good feeling about it. Let's go ahead and angle this down. All I gotta do now is align that plate like that. And as you can see, it covers that slot. That's really all I wanted to do, cover that slot. And let's go ahead and get the screws in. The other thing that's fun about 3D printing is you get to choose cool colors, even for a boring part like this. Now I have a cool shiny aqua accent on my camera rig. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's not perfectly aligned, but it's, it's going in there. Oh, no, it's good. Let me grab my Allen wrench to fix it, finish it off. Alright, got my Swiss Army Allen wrench. There we go. You can tighten it. And like I said, this is just backup. I have an actual screw here, but as I said at the beginning of the stream, it's come loose twice. I've dropped this thing twice and been lucky both times that I didn't smash the screen or something. So there we go. I'll make it nice, pretty tight, but not too tight. Yeah, nice. And how long has it been? Not even an hour. Even with me failing to switch screens and bumbling through that tutorial, I was able to have this part designed and printed in about 45 minutes. I think if I really just sat down and did it, I could have done it in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes maybe with the printing, but if that doesn't show you the power of 3D printing, I don't know what does. Anyways, that's it for uh, the live stream. I know it was a, kind of a quick little fun little thing. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, smash that like button. Uh, if you like the live streams, show this video some love. Um, maybe leave a comment after the live stream because Every time there's a live stream, everyone's chatting in the chat and then I end it. And then when it goes to the replay or whatever, the comments are empty because it doesn't post them there. And then my video is sad and lonely. So uh, come back in about 15 minutes and give the video a comment or a like. And uh, let me know, did you guys like this? Was it helpful? Should I keep trying to do it? Should I, should I just like get better at switching back and forth between camera shots? 
Or did you prefer my uh, rejected animals stream the other day, drawing things? Or should I do something else? If you guys have any suggestions for different types of live streams you want to see from me, put them in the comments. Not in the chat, put them in the comments, because otherwise it's hard to see. Okay, anyways, I've got the part I need, so I can go back to filming now and back to making some more uh, flashy, exciting videos for you guys. Anyways, it was fun to, fun to jump on the stream and say hi to everyone. Hope you're doing all right on this Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, depending on where you are. Shoot, it's Easter time for some of you already. Happy Easter. <laughs> all right, till next time. I'm Devin, this is Make Anything, and as always, stay safe, wash your hands, and stay inspired.